Well, welcome everyone to Steve Savant's Money, the name of the game. I'm your host, Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and money color commentator. On today's show, the truth about personal umbrella policies, part one of our series on asset protection strategies for business with Ike Devji, attorney and asset protection specialist. Welcome to the show, Ike. Thank you, Steve. It's a pleasure to be back. I should say welcome back, right, because you've been on before. Listen, you know, I always thought when I got into business, my property casualty agent came to me and said, Steve, I need, you need an umbrella policy. And I said, well, like how much? And he said, a million dollars. And I'm thinking, how much does that cost? It was $225, Ike. And I said, well, what does a two million cost? Eh, about double that. That's it? He says, now if you go to three million, four million or five million, now they have to do financial justification. So I had an umbrella because it was so cheap and it was just an extra layer of defense. I was mistaken. After hearing you speak one time, I thought that covered all my thing, my business, my personal, that was the wherewithal, that's why I got it. It was kind of a wake up call. So I wanna talk about the good part of an umbrella and also what you're not getting with an umbrella. Well, that's great and I'm, and I'm glad that, that you are making that distinction. First of all, as somebody who practices exclusively in the area of asset protection law, I probably am the biggest proponent of an umbrella policy out there. I think it's something that everyone should have. Uh, I think that regardless of what your net worth is, the level of protection that it provides you, as you said, dollar for dollar, to have that first million or two million for a few hundred dollars is an indispensable first line of defense. And dollar for dollar, it's cheaper than any other protection you can get. Mm -hmm. So let's start our conversation by being really clear about the fact that I think we both agree uh, you from your perspective on the financial side, me from my perspective on the legal side, yes, we want you to have it. Yes, a million dollars should be a good mm -hmm. minimum, and it should potentially be more on more than that based on your net worth. But there are also some really specific limits, and you're correct. One of the problems with the umbrella is consumers don't get where the line ends. Mm -hmm. They don't understand that most people, when they refer to that umbrella, are referring to a policy that covers items on their home and auto coverage only and it will not protect them from their business related risks in many cases it will not protect them from an employee mm -hmm. related lawsuit at the business they own from a HIPAA breach at the mm -hmm. business they own um, for something to do with a business dispute all of the other things that that we've talked about in our asset protection series now when you confront a businessman a businesswoman are they already in a disposition they think this covers my business side as well if I'm lucky, mm -hmm. they already have this coverage in place. Mm -hmm. But you would be surprised how many affluent people or people who are working night and day to build their first success, whatever mm -hmm. that is in their mind, that's a really subjective thing. I want to open my first company. I want to make, I bought my first mm -hmm. franchise. I want to buy my second one. I bought my first hotel. Whatever it is they're doing, mm -hmm. many of these people have themselves personally exposed and haven't done that. Mm. If they have done it, they're never clear on exactly mm -hmm. what it means and where, where the sidewalk ends. Okay, can I want to make sure I heard you right. So this protects my autos I own personally, not my autos that are owned by my business. Is that correct? Did I get that right? That is correct uh, as well. Okay, okay. And there's a distinction here because we're going to talk about who should own what because you really bring up some grits. And then the second thing is, is okay, my house. So it's an extra layer of defense. Somebody gets injured in my home. My, maybe my home policy doesn't take me all the way to the end. This is another extension on my personal home. That's correct. In most cases, what we see is, is an umbrella is, is a, additional coverage mm -hmm. over your base home and automobile personal liability policies. So it could be a car accident, it could be a slip and fall at, mm -hmm. at a guest at your home, it could be a tree on your property falls over uh, and does extensive damage to someone else's home like we've seen in, in many cases in mm -hmm. different parts of the country that have more severe weather than perhaps you and I have to deal with mm -hmm. here. Uh, we, we see lots of different things. I think also from a timing standpoint, the fact that you chose to do a show on this now mm -hmm. is very, very important. We are about to enter the 100 deadliest days. That is the period between Memorial Day and Labor Day where we see the highest number of accidents of all types, both at home and on the road and with vehicles. And the statistics are, why do they say, why, what's the concept, what's happening? Why? Yeah. I, well, I think you're going to be surprised at how simple the answer is. 
because it's summer vacation. So every grade school, mm -hmm. high school, and college kid in America and their parents mm -hmm. are on vacation, have more free time, have more unsupervised mm -hmm. time. Uh, people, kids, whatever, whatever your concept of kids is, whether it's teenagers or grade school or even high school and college age kids, are all out. They're using mm -hmm. mom and dad's homes, boats, cars, pools. They're having parties. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, and it's, we can't just blame kids. Families, adults mm. are all doing these things, and as such, it is the highest exposure time of the year. Wow. We have the most accidents, we have the most fatalities, we have the most liability generated personally at this time of year. So this wow. is a vital period where these exposures spike. And you know, we have 11 million car accidents a year, Steve, that cause 40,000 fatalities. Think about that, 40,000 wow. people killed a year None of us leave our home any, every, any morning intending to be part of something that mm -hmm. terrible, let alone the liability that would follow afterwards, right? Mm -hmm. So the umbrella is, again, that vital first line of defense on those issues as well. Okay, so it's not a magic shield for everything. It's good for these personal areas, the two you just described, home and auto. When you say, where does it end? I'm getting out of this. Uh, your pup policy, and that's why they call it a personal umbrella policy. It's personal, not business. This doesn't extend to your business on any uh, any way. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. That is correct. And there are also things that can make the the policy you do have uh, less effective. So, for instance, in Arizona, if you're not wearing your seatbelt, you know that they can reduce your medical payments by fifty percent. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. So, so I have a pub policy, but my pub policy may not go with me because I wasn't obeying the law on the seatbelt issue well, alone. And I'm using that as one sure. real specific example mm -hmm. of ways that the carriers have in their contracts, in the fine print that nobody reads, mm -hmm. there are limits or ways for them to reduce. So there may be some sort of contributory mm -hmm. negligence that can reduce your coverage so having as much coverage as you can, because you never know if you or someone else is going to make that mistake, is another mm -hmm. good reason to actually have the umbrella. But again, to understand that on its own, it's not a magic shield against anything and everything. Mm -hmm. And it has a limit. And those limits may be the dollar limit, or they may be the limits of what they decide to cover because of what the contract says. Wow, I mean, seatbelt, I'm thinking of texting, I'm thinking of all these things. If they found that out in the police report, right, that could damage your ability to get a reward. Right, and there are states now that have made texting and, and even talking, holding mm -hmm. a cell phone, for instance, while you're driving illegal. Mm -hmm. Not every state is the same. In those states, do you think that the carriers are trying to pay people who are doing those things mm -hmm. proximate to the accident? Do mm -hmm. you think the insurance companies would like to pay those people less? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, I do. I do. <laughs> um, okay, so, and you know, I have, uh, I was reading your key points of an umbrella. One always gets me, though, the, your, your, one of your last ones is, uh, you know, I've never had an accident. I haven't had an accident in 15 years um, spending money for nothing here. I already got uh, car insurance, and you say, your line is, don't go on ego. You know. We see that a lot. We see that not only in the, in the personal umbrella space, but in the professional liability insurance as well, right? Doctors will say, mm -hmm. I've never had a claim. Drivers will say, I've never been in an accident. I've been mm -hmm. driving 30 years. Well, you beat the odds. You got mm -hmm. lucky so far. I just told you that 11 million people mm -hmm. a year get in an accident and 40,000 of them are killed. None of those people plan to do that. So mm -hmm. it is not always a question of your skill or your care. It could be that, for instance, like one of them recently happened to one of my friends, he was the second to the last car in a seven car accident, mm. right? So somebody slammed into him from behind. He hit the person in front of him and it, five more cars mm -hmm. all in the same chain at a stoplight in an expensive neighborhood in Scottsdale, near, mm -hmm. near our Scottsdale Fashion Square. Mm. What do you think the odds are that many of the cars in that chain were worth $100,000 or more in that neighborhood? Wow. Right? Yeah. Do you think that that would be a stretch? No. no not, not at all. Not at all. Right? all. So, or what if you're driving home and there's a weather issue? Mm -hmm. Right. There are things that are always going to be outside our control and mm -hmm. merely being good at what you do or how you're doing it and being careful isn't enough to guarantee that an accident won't happen. Okay, so I need, this is what I just got out of this, I need a pup <laughs> and I need to be a sensible person. If they say wear a seatbelt, wear a seatbelt. If they say don't text and drive, don't text and drive. Don't hold your phone while you're driving. 
all those seem right. I was eating. I used to eat and drive with my knees. On the, I don't do that anymore either. I got to be sensible so that my policies will protect me. That's what I'm getting out of this. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's not, it's not a blanket guarantee mm -hmm. that the insurance company is making to protect you from anything you do, no matter how stupid your own actions may, be, may have been. Right? They expect that wow. you are doing everything you could have mm -hmm. done to avoid that harm, and that's where they step in. Don't forget to watch our next segment, The Liability of Your Employee's Actions, part two of our series on asset protection strategies for business. And keep in mind before moving forward with any of the ideas on our show, always check with your tax consultant, legal counsel, or your financial advisor. You've been watching Steve Savant's Money, the name of the game. <laughs>